And at this particular time, we're looking at how to brace ourselves up, bring up suggestions from this platform that helps us to create a secured environment. Now, in, 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 in saying this, each and every one of us in our personal contributions, our communal contributions, our national and, or, and et ethnic nationality contribution have something important that we can collect together from today's meeting. So therefore we can begin to wire them to the rights and appropriate quarters that help us to look at a Nigeria that we can be proud of. And so for this reason, all of us are gathered and for this reason, you are all welcome. Very briefly, I want to introduce um, the AFD on whose platform this discussion has been sponsored. The advocate for democracy is what the AFD means. And it is a, a group of Christian body and Christian professionals who are looking at the health of Nigeria, who are looking at the future of a great Nigeria in whatever form um, that will give it the best expression of God and godliness. And that is what the AFD stands for. And for those of us who probably would want us to stretch it a bit further, it is a part of the Christian social movement of Nigeria. And we have come to say welcome to you once again. Very briefly, we are going to introduce our guest speakers for this evening. And um, I'm going to call on um, our brother Richard, who's going to introduce to us our guest speakers. Brother Richard. Yes, I'm online. Okay, thank you so much, you're welcome. Okay, good evening all. And welcome to this second outing of AFD on the national questions that we've been tackling. And this time around, we are tackling the issue of security, national security, looking at it from the perspective of how the security arrangement of this country affects us. And if some of us have seen the uh, the flyers that we put out, you would have known that what we are considering is things that we need to, op options and ideas we need to come up with uh, before this issue of insecurity uh, consumes all of us. Uh, because we could spend all our time talking up and down and nothing is being done. So the topic before us today is before insecurity consumes us all, what options for personal, ethnic, and indigenous nationalities survivor? Um, our first speaker this evening, uh, we would actually need to uh, give a short explanation. The first speaker that we have advertised on the program is Professor Yusufu Turaki. Uh, he's unable to join us today because I suddenly discovered there was another pressing engagement which he actually had to attend to. Um, if it is still possible, um, maybe he will still be able to join us. Uh, but we have another speaker that actually would also do uh, justice to the same issue. Uh, is in the person of uh, Professor Gideon Paramalam. He had been at the forefront of the matter of uh, security and insecurity, especially in the Southern Kaduna and uh, the Middle Belt, Plateau and Benue, particularly the Plateau. 
uh, he have played a serious role in advocacy for peace and he has been doing a great work going in between even talking to many of the people on both sides both muslims and christians uh, traditional rulers on both sides emirs and uh, obas and every other person involved he has been going in between so he's very much uh, aware and well informed of the facts of insecurity he presently presides over the Peace Foundation, which he co-founded with his wife, Professor Fumi Paramalan. Uh, he is our speaker, our first speaker for today, and it's our pleasure to have him come on board uh, at this stage now. So it's my pleasure to call upon Professor Idion Paramalan. Professor, sir. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, my my dear precious brother and brethren, I, I want to thank you for this opportunity that I've been given to share with you. Um, I'm sorry that uh, my the, the light, it's not so okay for me. And if I try to receive this call outside, it's going to be distracted by lots of noise. So I had to come back inside, but it's not as bright but I hope that you can see me and you can also hear me. We can see you clearly and can, we can also hear you clearly. Ah, okay, thank you so much, yes. Okay, um, I, I, would, I would like to uh, just share some initial thoughts concerning a very important topic, the security situation before it consumes all of us in this country and those of us that are in the battlefront, particularly the middle belt, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's a very frightening situation. It's a situation that has existential consequences. Is a situation also that is systematic, consistent, and sustained. There's no one that can say this is when we will have a let off. So we're faced with a choice to become proactive and take our destiny in our hands and act to save ourselves or leave ourselves to fate. And then in the end, we just keep running around like headless chickens. But of course a headless chicken is already on its way to the grave to die to the stomach. So this is a very, a very important and reflective moment for me. And I'm, I'm very encouraged that AFD has been in the forefront of highlighting some of these concerns and some of these dangers and that we all have to uh, look at. Now, I will just share without making a direct presentation, some thoughts. And then after that, I have a PowerPoint. There were quickly four things I would like to share from that PowerPoint. And, and maybe from that PowerPoint, I can make further comments before I stop. Not many people understand what I've described as near genocidal killings taking place in Nigeria, particularly the Middle Belt. I've been very careful in carefully calling it near genocidal uh, for reasons that if I go into it, it's also gonna take away much of our time. And so I'm very careful about it. But it's a very complex situation that's going on in the North, particularly in the Middle Belt. And, and maybe if I can just appeal to the organizers that I don't go too deep into this until we have another opportunity because it's always good 
to unpack rather than just making flying statements that cannot be substantiated. But I want to give an example. How I got into some of these things that's going on is because I live in Jos, in Plateau State. And in 2010, January 17th to be precise, uh, uh, an attack took place in a church, Equa Church. Now, the history goes back, but I want to live up those, that history and pick up from 2010. And I happened to be in the country at the time when it occurred. And then the Lord led me to sort of get involved in it. And I was involved uh, talking to both the governor at the time, it was Governor Jang, talking with his deputy, Paul Tallinn at the time, talking with the commissioner of police, talking with the military commander for the STF, reaching out to the GOC, reaching out to the army headquarters in Abuja. So it was no fun at that time. And it got to a point, I still remember that afternoon, I was talking to church leaders and say, look, what's going on? We need to do something. And I can say this uh, for, for the benefit of our own reflection, the desperation that some of us have gotten into in the middle belt. I recall one pastor saying to me, I've got two guns. I know where you live. Perhaps that place may look secure, but you may need one. Where I live is dangerous. Do you think I should give you one of those guns? I, I obviously didn't collect the gun, but I got the message and I got where he was headed towards because of the desperation and the concern. And, and this is a, a brother that I don't want to go into details here. So then at that time also, then I got in touch. Then this afternoon, when things were getting bad, it was Sunday afternoon, getting to Monday. And by Tuesday in the morning, I was already on the phone again, back to the governor. Look, this thing is not looking like abating. It was getting very serious. And as I was still on the phone with the governor, I had spoken to Archbishop Ben Kwashi, I had spoken to Equa president at the time, Farin Toy and several others. Guess what happened? A 24 hours coffee was declared. The rest of it is history, which I won't go into. So the, what those attacks began to move from the urban areas, from the city center, and began to move towards the rural areas, and then the suburb of Jaws. And then we began to have sporadic attacks in some of these places. To cut a long story short, Sometimes in March, over 500 people were killed in one single night. Dogonaha, for some of us that would recall that uh, story, very tragic story. So, and, and so before you realize it, those attacks have continued consistently. And several local governments in Plateau State have come under very severe attacks. Now, as I'm speaking with us, a number of communities in Barakin Ladi local government, in Riom local government, around the Mahanga area, most of the plateau people have basically left those lands. They cannot go back because you go back, you just get killed. Now, We've confirmed that some of those places have been occupied, taken over, and fresh buildings springing up, specifically by the Fulanis that were orchestrating some of those attacks. Now, you would also recall that in, towards the end of June, there was a massive attack that took place in which over 200 people were killed in a matter of hours. Now, I need to tell us this because we may not know this. There was swift reaction from the government, both at the federal, but particularly from the state government that led to that situation coming under control. I'm just saying this for the benefits of our own understanding, actually. The reaction of the federal government led to the removal of the SDF commander at the time. Now, the Plateau State Governor got into action and it led to the arrest of a number of people, including the kingpin that inspired that attack. And from that time till now, there's a little bit of respite, but some of the people who left have never gone back. 
So right now, there is a struggle to see how those communities could be collected back and handed over to their rightful owners. They said, bill in the House of Assembly, there are a number of things going on, but I just need us to know that these attacks have been consistent. They are not abating, but for the intervention of the Lord to provide a little bit of love. So that's Plateau State. And I will quickly move to Southern Kaduna. Southern Kaduna is where I come from, although I live in Jos. And Sukapu just reported yesterday that over 1,004 communities have been occupied, basically, literally snatched. Now, some of those places that have been occupied, I happen to know them. The people cannot go back there because of its dangerous nature. And these are things that are creating lots of concern. And you, Sukapo also reported about 50,000 people that have been displaced. So IDP is internally displaced. Okay, I've connected in talking to some of the people and I confirm frankly that those people just can't go back to their places. So that is a fact. But permit me also, for the sake of objectivity and fairness, because some of us may not know this, there are also certain communities occupied by the Fulani, specifically in Zango and Kataf, that they've been driven from those settlements. That is a fact. And because of my involvement from both sides of the divide, you'll be shocked. I can actually show you pictures, photos, photos of dead bodies, both from the Fulanis, but also majority dead bodies from our own people that have been recorded. So there is a deliberate attempt to make sure that driving people from the ancestral form, homelands, particularly in Southern Kaduna State, is stopped. But then how do we do it? It's not easy. And so what I tend to see is that there's been a lot of talking, but there's been less action in actually securing those communities. I think one of the things we need to talk about, and very clearly, some of us are talking very honestly, is to see how those communities could be secured. Because in the absence of those communities, because I work on peace building, it's impossible to have peace. So that I've been able to speak in public without fear or favor. So the next third thing before I round up is the aspect of the southward movements of Boko Haram. Now, when I quickly make two points, I would like to go back and quickly ask that the PowerPoint be flashed so that I can comment on my PowerPoint. Now, self-defense is a natural right for everybody. I have never been able to wrap my head around once indigenous people, what I call ethnic nationalities, or some people call autochthonous people, the people who really own that place. That's where God gave to us as Southern Kaduna. I've never been able to wrap my head around anybody saying that when people rise up to defend themselves, then they engage in revenge killings. It's not correct. They are not revenge killings. Is as simple as people coming under attack and then they react. Now, the nature of their reaction may be something that people may not accept. That is, you cannot deny them the right to defend themselves. So that is on the ground. So it's natural. The second thing also is self-defense as a constitutional right that is enshrined in our constitution. And I graciously ask both our brothers, Rutimi and Richard, to just help me Google it. Just pick it up for me because, so I can have enough time to, to, to make my final preparation to do this presentation. So the right to life is there in the Nigerians 1999 constitution, section 33, one. Every person has a right to life. And I think if Christians are going to craft an argument is to be able to pick on these constitutional provisions to argue the case out. 
Should I encourage Christians to go on revenge killings? No. By my pedigree as a peace builder and somebody who really knows the situation on the ground, I wouldn't support that. Now, the right to self-defense is not explicitly stated in the Constitution, but it's fully implied to the right to life. And I think that's part of the argument we should be able to bring down and has been upheld in several decisions of the courts, especially in criminal law court, that a person who is attacked by another without provocation, his actions in self-defense would be justified in law and not be taken as constituting an offense. Now, this is the kind of awareness that we need as Christians in order to argue our cases and push to defend our communities. Now, let me say this very clearly, and I'm not afraid. And I can say this publicly. I can even say this before the security. If the indigenous people of Southern Kaduna, of Plateau, of Benue, all of those in the Middle Belt do not find ways to defend themselves, then we'll wake up one day and discover that none of these communities are in existence and the rest of it will be history. Now, think about South Sudan. Think about some of those communities in Sudan itself. So, the place of self-defense is there. And I'm ready to argue this out with those who say no. That's why I say to people, just because Muslims are killed, Christians should not be denied from crying out when they get killed. So I want to just quickly pause here and quickly ask whether it's possible uh, for, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's Pastor Bosun helping to just flash out my PowerPoint. I want to quickly make a comment and then I wrap up. Continue, continue, please. For me, so thank you. Okay, yes. So what I need now is to be able to see the PowerPoint because the next points I'm making is tied to the Powerpoints. Yes. So, yes. so if you can just share. Hello? You can share, you can share. Go ahead. Uh, can I share? Okay, wow, I didn't know that. So let me, hey, to share, I now have to put on my... I have to put on my, okay, let me see if I can try and get it. Okay, thank you. Then let me try and see if I can get it. Just bear with me, please bear with me because I was not prepared for this. But let me quickly, uh, I'm online, so no problem. I was using my phone to speak, but now I would uh, have to go. If you need your laptop. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm now going to, to, to try and connect through my laptop. Okay, so I'll be having two devices. Oosh. Okay, yes, uh, I'm moving now. Uh, okay, it's asking me to wait. So if you let me in, thank you, Pastor Bosun. Okay. okay. To divide market for you to speak, us it will it will echo. So best. Yes, I know. I'll get one out. Okay. Uh, so now I would. Let me try and share screen. Uh, once I can share my screen, I'm going to. Okay, can you see the screen? Hello? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay, um, I don't know why I've shared it, but it's not coming through. Um, can, can you help me share it from there? No, oh, it's not from here. Everything that needs to be done from my end has been done. Okay, so I don't know why it's not sharing. The edge coin is because you have to divide, so you have to get off one. You have to get yes, yes, one. Exit the phone. No, it's okay. I'll 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 leave the phone and then see. Yes. But I just want. Uh, a situation. Uh, yeah, I will exit the phone now. Prof, what you can do is use your iPhone. Use your iPhone to to pick up the image on your laptop. Use the iPhone no. camera to pick up the image on the laptop. Is it wow. his laptop now? We it's can see him. So for me now. Let, let yeah, me leave just the phone and then phone. try it. The phone. 
use, get off the phone and just use what you're using. Reverend, you've been made the co-host, so you should be able to, maybe you try it again um, from your laptop. You've been made the co-host now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let, let me, let, I think it may be more of a technical problem with my computer because I can try to share again now, you see. Let's see if it will agree. Uh, it's giving me a, a, a message that's not so uh, healthy. Okay, let me try and do share now and see. No, I think there's a challenge. It's not, it's not agreeing. No, no, it's telling me screen sharing has failed to start. Let's try again. And then it's error. I've been, I, I think I should have sorted this out before coming in. It's not allowing me to share. Please just move your camera or the phone. Okay. And put it on. I'm trying to do that now. Let me, let me, I'm trying to do that now. I'm trying to do that. Okay, great. Can you see it? Ah, uh, my God. If I, okay, fine. Let, let me, I have to, let me, let me reconnect. Okay, just wait. I, I, I wish, I'm sorry. The device on your table, the device yeah. on your table that is showing you is showing your the, the phone you are holding. But what we need is for you to turn that device to look at your laptop. That's what I'm trying. What I'm, trying I'm trying to do that now. So let me exit my my computer and then just use the the. Uh, it's okay, I'll do something. Don't worry. I'm sorry about this. Okay, so. so. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Now, I'm honestly trying to get Oh dear, I don't. Huh. Please go ahead with your comments. Maybe later on we can figure out how to. Okay, let me see. Can you see it now? Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get. Oh. Okay, is it bigger? Yes. Very big. yeah. it's bigger, it's bigger. Okay, so just bear with bigger. me. I'm sorry about this technology stuff. Now, can you, okay, so quickly, um, of course, the practical steps to securing our lives and properties in indigenous nationalities, which I've commented on. But what I wanted us to see here is to look at the triumvirate of evil. One of them, Boko Haram. One of uh, the second is the Fulani Hartsmen. The third is the bandits. And then what we also see is a classical case of terrorism, criminality, and impunity. Now, um, we bear this in mind. So here is a... Uh... Oh my God.
um, just um, come in. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, it's okay. So uh, can you see? It? So I'm moving fast now. Okay. So this is the slide actually that I wanted to is to look at Nigeria's security of its citizens. So you look at it. I talked about Boko Haram. Boko Haram is located in the northeastern part of Nigeria, the epic center. Now, the Fulani Hartsmen are located in the northwestern part of the country, but as you know, there's fluid movements of the Fulani Hartsmen. They can move in from any part of the country. They also move in from any part of West Africa and they push downwards. But look at the nature of the attacks of Boko Haram. Now, in 2018, when that massive attack took place on the plateau and over 200 people were killed, again, for the sake of all of us here, there was actually an imam that rescued a number of Christians. He actually offered his life. And he told those attackers, if you're going to break into this mosque and kill these Christians, the ethnic nationalities that are here, you'll have to kill me first. And he's an elderly man. And then eventually they left. So that's how some people were rescued because of the heroic act of this act of this man. Now, during that time, this is why I brought it. When I was interviewed by journalists, I was leaving Germany and then I stopped at the, air, at, the, an, at, an, at the airport in Heathrow. When some people, some journalists got to know I was in, in London, they came over to the airport and interviewed me shortly before I flew into Nigeria. And in that interview, I said, look, what is Boko Haram? All these hatsmen, they're Boko Haram disguised, transformed into some of these Fulani hatsmen to attack these communities. There were people that said, wow, that's true. There were people that said no. But let me say this today. You look at the way Boko Haram is doing. They move from the, from, from, from the northeast. You can see them pushing to the center. And of course, they moved beyond this. Okay, you look at Fulani hatsmen also moving all to the center and so current attacks now, but it's really gone beyond these current attacks. The current attacks are still going, but if they, there's a lot of concentration, of concentration of attacks in the Middle Belt, the North Central areas. But there are some of them also that have come all the way, all the way, sorry, all the way, there are some of them who have come all the way, move Southwest, move South, South, move southeast. There's a lot going on in the southeast. I don't know whether some of us are following up things, but now let me come to the center. Boko Haram occasionally leaves where they are in the northeast and they actually come as close as between Bauchi and Gombe and pick up people. Polycap Zungu that was picked up by the army of Khalifa, which is an offshoot of Iswa, they actually picked them up, they picked him up between Bauchi and Gombe. So sometimes they come from Potiskom, Yobe side, coming down to Kari, they can pick on anybody. And sometimes they just wait for people to come. Once you pass Bauchi state and you're entering Yobe state, they can pick you off from there or you're entering, going to my degree, they pick you off from there. So a lot of that, is taking place with some kind of intelligence, but I would leave it because somebody is gonna be talking about intelligence gathering and things like that. So I don't want to go into that, but just to say that it's a bit of coordination and people tend to try to deny it. Denying it does not help us because without that kind of coordination, some of the attacks that we're seeing, some of those attacks cannot just be carried out by people who are just doing it by chance. So you have a situation in which sometimes 50 people can invade a particular community like in Plateau in Southern Kaduna. So when most of these are taking place, what do people expect those who are living in their ancestral homelands to do? 
Now, it would be our joy if the government lived up to its responsibility to be able to repel these attacks, but it's not been easy. The history is there for all of us. The stories are there for all of us to know that these people can simply go to schools, pack as many school children as they want, and disappear with them as hostages. It's happening in Kaduna, happening in Niger, happening in Katsina State. If the security could have rescued us, those will not take place. And some of the security have been honest to say, look, they cannot be in every single community, every single village in Nigeria. So when the security are honest enough to say that, what should the people be doing? That is where proactive steps will be required. Now, I want to close by saying that I wrote an article for the Luzanne Global Analysis and I came up with seven steps, what I call the ne Nehemiah model that Christian communities can adopt in order to defend themselves. I would share that link so that those seven steps Nehemiah model could be picked out and studied by us and we see what we can do. I think because I'm not the only speaker, I want to beg at this point to just round up and crave your indulgence. Please, I'm very sorry for the technical hitches, but I pray that some of the thoughts I've shared would be of help to us in one way or the other. And may the Lord bless us in Jesus' name. Hello. Hello. Hello, Amen. hello, yeah. Thank you, Hi. thank you, that's all. I finished. That's been, one, that's been wonderful, thank, thank you, sir. Dr. Bosson. Hello. Yeah. So we thank God for the session we've just had. Um, we know some of us might want to have some questions for Professor Gideon Paramalam. Uh, there will be a time when we could ask our questions because of shortage of time. We want to quickly move on now. So I'll be uh, inviting my co-host, uh, Reverend Linda Tokuta to introduce the next speaker. Reverend Linda, please. Thank you so very much. Our next speaker is um, somebody that may not be known to most of us, uh, but nevertheless, he is um, a Nigerian of, um, or an American of Nigerian descent. I figure he might want to tell us by himself. Uh, but the little bit that we have you know, concerning him is that he is an intelligent, intelligence gathering professional, is a drone uh, technology specialist, um, is also a communal collaboration in checkmating insecurity. His name is uh, Mr. Eno Umar. And uh, we are very happy to have you around, uh, Mr. Umar. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank and you for uh, we'll, just, we'll just hand over to you now. So you have to um, please uh, um, uh, forgive me that I haven't made a proper introduction, uh, but I figure if there's anything more you need us to add to it, you, you can assist us as well. We're sure. very happy to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for having me for uh, the great uh, introduction and um, just my sincere regards and, and thank you to uh, the host and the organizers um, of this uh, event, which is very a very big topic, of course, um, to security um, in Nigeria is, is something that we all um, care about. And um, it's conversations like this that will help, um, you know, drive um, the improvements and looking at different ways to innovate um, and use practical solutions. So um, yes, um, my name is, is Eno, Enobong uh, Umo. Um, I am from uh, Akwaibum State. Um, uh, technically I was born uh, in the US, but I am 
uh, very much connected uh, to my home here. Um, I actually uh, recently relocated um, fully to Nigeria uh, late last year um, to mm -hmm. start uh, my company here, which is the Global Air Drone Academy. So um, what I will do now is to um, share my screen and then I have um, just some um, uh, uh, use cases that I'd like to show you regarding how drones are being used uh, in security and of course, you know, how this can be applied um, in areas here uh, in Nigeria. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thumbs yes, yes. Okay, all right, great. Okay, um, so again, uh, very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much um, for the uh, invitation and especially uh, Dr. Amal uh, from the Lunar Deck um, organization for inviting me here today. So um, I am the uh, co-founder of uh, two organizations, uh, one uh, being Global Air Media, uh, the other being the Global Air Drone Academy. Um, and just simply put, the Global Air Media, uh, which we refer to as GAM, G-A-M, is really our commercial arm. So this is where we use drone technology for um, data gathering, for it could just be uh, photography and some, some video of, of um, very special um, areas um, drones for um, uh, delivery purposes, uh, not specifically here um, in Nigeria, um, but in other areas, especially in uh, the U.S. and Kenya, uh, that are exploring the uses for. Uh, uh, I think someone's microphone is on. Um, so yes, yeah, so we also started uh, GATA, which is also known as the Global Air Drone Academy. And I'm not sure if that's, someone can meet the person. Okay. All right. So um, we also uh, started Global Air Drone Academy because we knew that the industry really wasn't going to grow um, at the pace we wanted it to grow unless more people were just generally aware of what drone technology um, is and uh, to not be afraid, you know, of this technology, of course, um, there's a lot of concerns about just general, you know, security and, and how do we make sure that drones are being used in a proper fashion. So we um, specialize in teaching uh, the right and ethical uses of drone technology uh, through our innovative uh, courses. Uh, so a little bit um, about myself, um, as I mentioned, um, I am uh, from a, a quiet room state. Um, I've been traveling uh, back and forth to Nigeria for years now until, um, as I mentioned, I uh, decided to relocate um, really just to uh, get the business um, started on the ground here. Um, but over the last uh, several years, um, we started actually in 2015. So since 2015, uh, we've been able to do a lot of different um, innovative jobs all around the world. Um, you can see here on the top right-hand side, this is in uh, Ethiopia. And uh, we're actually using uh, drone technology to map a certain areas of land. Excuse me. Excuse Please mute everybody, then you mute yourself and speak because there's quite a lot of interference. If you could mute everybody. All right, I think we are Thank good you. We've muted yes. everybody. You can go okay. on, um, uh, right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, we've done uh, did various projects from Ethiopia here to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we were actually mapping out um, uh, refugee camps, uh, which are still um, in place today in uh, Cox's Bazar, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, over 200,000 uh, refugees in one place. Um, and also wanted to point out, we were awarded a grand prize um, at the African Drone Forum in February of last year. This was a continent-wide uh, drone business competition. And uh, we actually pitched the drone, uh, Global Air Drone Academy at this event. Um, we were able to uh, win the event. And uh, with that funding, the seed funding is what we actually use to start our offices um, here in Nigeria. So we're, we're uh, based here um, in Victoria Island uh, in Lagos. 
and uh, we're available for all types of um, in-person and virtual uh, trainings as well. Um, there is a licensing uh, system uh, that we have uh, in the States and we're also looking to uh, implement here um, in Nigeria, but this is just um, a look at what the actual license looks like. Um, the uh, civil aviation authorities, they treat drone pilots um, as you know, actual pilots and they consider drone, the drones are aircraft. Uh, so when you're operating drones in the national airspace, um, you pretty much have to have the same credentials as um, a pilot who was flying um, a manned aircraft. So just gonna touch on a little bit of the introduction, of course, of, of who we are, um, talk about drones and public safety, uh, of course, drones for security surveillance, and then some of the opportunities that we have um, at the uh, uh, Drone Academy as well. Uh, so again, we have um, uh, conducted classes all around the world. Um, we do a lot of focus on our youth. Um, we, we cover youth and adults as well, but for youth specifically, um, we have all types of in-school programming, after school, summer camps. Uh, we really want them to understand that drone technology is um, the future and we want to prepare them now uh, for these jobs that are coming uh, for them. So what is the problem? You know, why did we uh, start uh, the academy? So we've seen that as interest in drone technology continues to grow, um, Africa um, faces a severe shortage of professionally tra trained drone professionals. So this is everyone from regulators to pilots to educators. And um, as many countries um, here in Nigeria as well, as we're facing high unemployment rates among youth, uh, we need to think of um, innovative ways to create jobs in STEAM, otherwise known as science, technology, engineering, the arts, um, and math. Uh, we've seen uh, tremendous growth in the drone um, industry. Projected growth this is by Price Waterhouse Coopers um, that predicts the industry will be worth $43 billion by 2024. Uh, we've also seen uh, reports about the high unemployment rates that we've seen, of course, um, all around um, Africa. So some of the specific use cases uh, for security drones uh, we've seen, and this is just actually a small list um, of all the different applications, but everything from facility uh, perimeter control, um, something that is really big um, uh, for nighttime operations and, and daytime as well, um, the thermal uh, and night vision camera sensors. Uh, we've also seen drones for election security and monitoring. Uh, we've seen for our risk assessment of uh, uh, reports. Um, traffic and railway surveillance, surveillance, this is more with uh, transportation, but of course, um, being able to program the drone to do um, uh, coordinated uh, data gathering, um, using that data to enter into like an AutoCAD or a CAD system uh, to actually see 2D and 3D models of what's going on. Uh, we've also seen remote area inspections, so of course, reaching places that are hard um, to, to get to, um, either by road or by boat, uh, really secluded areas. Uh, of course, mapping is, is very big as well. So when I mean mapping, of course, this is more what, what you would see on Google Earth or Google Maps. That 2D image that is normally out of date, um, you know, sometimes I've seen, uh, you know, they haven't updated their satellite imagery for Nigeria, sometimes up to a year or sometimes more than that. So you cannot depend on that Google image for your real time accurate reading. So with drones, you can actually create this type of map, this 2D and 3D model in real time. And by real time, I mean, in a, in a few hours, between two to three hours, you can have um, this map. You don't have to wait uh, for long periods of time. Of course, uh, facility inspections, um, anti-poaching, um, animal conservation, um, securing large and uh, critical uh, infrastructure, um, crowd control, and um, even some of these applications that you may not have um, heard of or realized, but um, this is still in development. Right, this is yeah. why I have the stars mm -hmm. here, but license plate reader and uh, face of recognition is technology that's being worked on as well. So uh, some recent news about uh, drone technology, we've seen uh, security related drone sales are expected to increase nearly seven times over the next decade. Uh, we have links to these articles. Of course, well, as well. um, we also see that current trends show that over half of security industry respondents are either using drones now or will be in the near future. 
We've seen 55% of customers reporting increased uh, safety as a result of drone usage. And we've seen that 92% of country companies using drones are seeing a uh, return on investment uh, within one year of use. So some of the organizations that are current, currently using drones uh, for security, and this is um, mainly um, on the US side, but of course, uh, this is applicable in uh, many countries, including here um, in Nigeria. Uh, security related drone usage for public safety is taking place in nearly every state uh, with Texas, California, and Wisconsin having the most UAVs in current operation. Uh, there are currently 28 states out of 50 um, that have at least one public safety agency deploying drones for security and data gathering. So this is the, your police officers, this is the uh, medical um, ambulance, um, EMT, um, and also our firefighters as well. So they are all um, using uh, drone technology in various uh, ways. Um, Customs and Border Protection uh, flew several hundred domestic-based drone missions in association with other state and local agencies. Um, and North Dakota Army National Go Guard has flown missions in support of border enforcement and legal drug interception. So the list goes on and on. Um, again, uh, there are many different use case scenarios uh, for this technology. And um, again, you know, very applicable to here in Nigeria as well. So just to understand um, some of the main types of drones that we are using today. Um, and uh, the first three here are known as our uh, multi-rotor drones. Um, and then we have our, our fixed wing as well. So just starting with the multi-rotor, uh, we have a quadcopter, um, hexacopter and octocopter. Um, mainly the smaller drones um, as in the quadcopter is really only gonna be used for uh, visual um, uh, just a normal uh, camera for, for visual purposes. It's very limited on payload. Um, so you're not gonna be able to carry any larger sensors. So let's say you have um, like a LIDAR, you know, laser sensor that you want to use. You'd most likely have to use one of these bigger drones as in a hexacopter or an octocopter. You can see here in a hexacopter, the, um, the, the payload is, is bigger. Um, and you generally will see longer flight times uh, with a hexacopter. Um, octocopter, um, as you can see here, this is actually one that's used for um, agricultural purposes to, to spray uh, crops, uh, but that's not the only type of sensor that you can use on an octocopter. You can actually remove this and actually install um, a much bigger um, camera. And of course, it being an octocopter can last um, for uh, longer uh, period of time. We've also seen fixed wing drone. Uh, fixed wings are used for more long distance flights. Um, so say if you have anything over, um, you know, eight to 10 kilometers and, and, and up, you would most likely use a fixed wing drone because it's just able to carry uh, cover much larger areas of land um, and it doesn't consume a whole lot of battery life. So fixed wing drones are typically the ones who last longer um, as opposed to a quadcopter, which you will probably see a max flight time of about 25 minutes, uh, depending on which model that you get. So as you as you uh, increase um, in the number of propellers, of course, that number slightly raises up, um, but the fixed wing drone will definitely have um, the longest flight time out of these four types of drones. So um, we do have a training um, that we do, and uh, specifically, I uh, wanted to just mention uh, one of the drones that um, has spurred some interest here. Um, it's called the uh, DJI Enterprise Dual Drone. And this drone is, is special because it comes with a few different um, tools. So first of all, um, well, actually I'll start here. First of all, it has a thermal camera that is automatically and already installed um, into the drone. So before now you would have to uh, specifically buy a thermal camera separately and uh, you know, manually install it to the drone. But DJI, they now have a model that comes with it inbuilt here. So you actually have two cameras on this drone. You have a, a regular RGB camera and then you have your thermal camera uh, right here. So these can be run simultaneously. And I'll show you an example of uh, actually what that looks like. This drone also comes with a spotlight 
Um, so if you are flying in a very dark area, you can actually fly the drone over. And I want to say this gets up to about 2000 lumens, uh, which is very, very bright. Um, so you can see this, you know, uh, clear, uh, clear as day um, in the nighttime if you're going to um, uh, investigate somewhere. Um, this is a speaker. All right. So um, if you wanted to actually send out different messages, um, depending on you know where you are, you could be amongst a crowd of people. Um, you can use this to, to send out different messages, pre-recorded messages um, to you know encourage safety or really you know to, to, to disseminate any message that you want to. Um, this also comes with a beacon. Um, this is not really for security purposes, but this is just so um, other drones and other um, actually aircraft can see where your drone is. So of course, if you're in a high security area, you may not wanna use this uh, to give yourself away, um, but this is um, just some of the um, uh, accessories that come with this drone. I um, mean, you can see that the 10 module um, uh, topics that we cover um, in this course, um, so you can understand fully um, how to use these drones um, from front to back. Um, I've mentioned uh, some of the features here. This is just like a, a, a small breakdown. And of course, I, I will share uh, the slides um, with uh, the organizers to send out as well. Um, so we recently conducted a training with the uh, NDA, the uh, Nigerian Defense Academy. Um, and essentially what they wanted to um, you know, know is, is how to utilize these, the same drone that I'm uh, speaking to you about. So we taught them one. Uh, drone maintenance and repair. Uh, we had some hands-on flight skills training. Um, this is the real-time mapping that I just mentioned. So on the left hand side here, this is a map that we actually produced with the drone. And on that same day, at the same time, this is actually what Google Earth is showing. So you can see the drastic difference um, in what the drone is able to do as opposed to what you would be depending on um, with uh, Google uh, maps. Uh, this is a uh, thermal uh, uh, imagery uh, from nighttime operations. This is uh, farther away, um, but you can, you know, the closer that you can get and you can actually zoom in um, to actually see um, uh, people and things like that on the ground. Uh, this is a look at the uh, drone speaker that I mentioned. And then this is a snapshot from the, the spotlight that we used um, this is just a test that we ran. This was um, at, you know, I believe about 11 uh, p.m. at night. So pitch black darkness um, and you're able to shine it over uh, certain areas. This actually was during, um, I guess, the peak of, of Hamatan as well in, in Kaduna. Uh, so it was a very, very um, a difficult night to see anything. But the fact that, it, you know, you were able to make out who's on the ground um, is very powerful as well. Uh, so just not going to take up too much time, just a few uh, minutes. Um, uh, we're definitely open to uh, speaking and, and expanding more about this. Um, there are a ton of applications, of course, that cut along uh, many different lines. So um, we offer trainings in um, industry specific areas, online programming, a consultation for businesses and, and agencies that want to use drone technology, um, entrepreneurship and business coaching. Uh, I will mention that we just did a uh, conducted a program um, that was funded and, and sponsored by the uh, U.S. Consulate General called the Nigerian Drone Business Competition. Um, the winner of the competition, excuse me, her name is uh, Miss Mary Brenda Okoda, and her idea was actually to use drones to help curb uh, the kidnapping and the insecurity that we're seeing here. So um, she was able to win the top um, prize um, at the competition. Um, so with that, she will be uh, working on that uh, business idea and we are um, mentoring her and developing that um, along the way. Uh, some of the other courses that we offer um, that you can uh, get a look at, some of our uh, past projects and people uh, that we work with as well. So um, hopefully that gives you uh, some more perspective on, on how drones are being used and um, please, if there's any, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I think we have some time at the end, um, but that is um, how drones are being used um, in the security space. So uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to elaborate. All right.
we're so we're so very grateful, uh, Mr. Mo, for such a wonderful, um, very deep and explanatory um, presentation of the drone in Nigeria's security situation. We observe that you have developed so much and you have actually been on the ground, you know, um, and that, that makes a lot of difference. I would like us to um, begin to get our questions ready. I, I think perhaps we might need to ask uh, Mr. Omo quite a number of questions. So you're either posting your questions on the chat or perhaps you want to leave it to a time when um, we will throw up questions. If Mr. Omo is still going to be around, are you still going to be around till the close of yeah. the program? I'll, okay. I'll stick around, yeah, no problem. Thank you so very much. Would, um, would um, have a time separate because I'm sure a number of people would have questions for you. Thank you so much for your presentation. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yes. Thank you. Um, Brother Richard, is it? Brother Richard? Yes, ma, I'm on. Yes. Um, are we yeah. going to take questions now or do we, or would you want us to take on our third speaker? What do you think? We better just take the third person. Otherwise, if we start taking questions now, you will not be able to enter. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's just take him quickly. Please, our audience uh, will be very glad if you will just note your questions. Uh, these are our speakers. They have graciously agreed. They, they are still around and they will answer all your questions. I've seen many people are asking questions concerning the seven steps, seven Neymar model steps. Uh, for ensuring peace that uh, Professor uh, Gideon Paramaran spoke about earlier. But right now I want to go to the third speaker. His name is Barista Emmanuel Ogebe. Uh, he runs uh, an uh, American uh, lawyer's outfit for social justice. Uh, he's a brother that I've known uh, for a very long time, uh, was acquainted also with uh, his, his uh, pedigree, uh, particularly the work of his father, the judge in Nigeria, uh, justice of the Court of Appeal, and I think briefly, uh, maybe at the Supreme Court. So he's going to be speaking on dynamic strategies for engaging Nigerians in the diaspora and the international community for for quelling insecurity, the dynamic strategies for engaging Nigerians in the diaspora and the international community for quelling insecurity. Uh, I believe Paris Ogebe is in the house. Are you in the house, sir? Yes, I am. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you around. So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, my beloved brother. Uh, I want to thank everybody who put together this uh, event. Um, I also want to apologize in advance. I just returned from Nigeria yesterday. I'm jet lagged, I'm under quarantine, so I will not give you PowerPoint presentation. We will just have a chat and hopefully during the questions and answers, we can uh, interact more. The first point I would like to make is that the topic that we have, I wish was slightly different because the responsibility for global advocacy for the persecuted cannot be limited to merely the diaspora. It is a rep responsibility for all of us and we all should be brand ambassadors for the persecuted. Now, there are three levels of engagement in global advocacy for the persecuted. One is with the local embassy and missions of the various uh, countries that are involved with Nigeria. So that first tier is right there in Nigeria, engagement with the diplomatic corps. The second level of engagement is with the international visitors who come into Nigeria. The pastors, the tourists, the business people, they are potential partners for carrying your message back into their country. And then the third tier of engagement is direct engagement with the host country, the host governments, and the host people 
you know, uh, when you travel overseas, uh, as the case may be. Uh, so that said, it shows that the, the diaspora is just one aspect of the uh, engagement and that even uh, brethren in Nigeria are a critical part of that engagement when you interface with the embassy in Nigeria and also when you interface with visitors in Nigeria. Now, let me start by illustrating uh, one of these points. One of the biggest challenges we have had with regard to advocacy uh, uh, concerning the problem in Nigeria is the lack of knowledge that a lot of Nigerians themselves have about what is happening in our country. Some years ago, we invited, we, we felt it was necessary to bridge that gap. So we arranged to invite the president of Cannes, the then president of Cannes, to come and uh, address the US Congress. And after he spoke in the Congress, we sat down and we opened up to him and said, sir, one of our, my biggest problems in advocacy in America is Nigerians in diaspora. He said, how is that so? I said, I would engage a lot of US congressmen and women and brief them about what is happening in Nigeria. And when they travel to their consist constituencies and meet Nigerians, those Nigerians in diaspora don't know what is happening in Nigeria. And when they are asked by their congressmen, they are not able to respond affirmatively to reinforce the advocacy that we did. So when we broke that problem down to him, he was so concerned that we came up with a dynamic strategy for utilizing the diaspora to engage across America. So he went back to Nigeria and I won't go into operational details for uh, security reasons, obviously, but working with other uh, PFM pastors, we were able to conceive the idea of Canaan, Christian Association of Nigerian Americans. Through this mechanism, we hoped to mobilize Nigerians across the US to engage uh, their various constituencies on the issue of persecution in Nigeria. At the very first meeting of uh, you know, Christian leaders, Ni Nigerian Christian leaders in the US to discuss the vision of Canaan, one man got up, a Nigerian pastor, and said, all this nonsense of insecurity they're talking about in Nigeria is not true, that he just held a, a crusade in Nigeria. So why are we calling this meeting? And the room was in, in deep silence. So I had to respond to him and start giving him facts and figures of what was happening in Nigeria. That was how we realized that we had a problem, that even if Nigerian pastors themselves are not aware or convinced about what is happening at home, how can they carry the message to the American community? Now, uh, Kenan did and in initially did a good job of mobilizing across the US we launched in over almost 20 states. Unfortunately, what ended up happening was that the head of Canaan took an appointment in Nigeria with the Buhari regime, and that led to the organization going comatose. So we do not have that strong uh, advocacy anymore from Canaan due to the compromise of the leadership. Now, having said that, I want to quickly mention the second problem we have, which is with American pastors who visit Nigeria. We have a situation where American pastors come to Lagos and have a camp meeting and preach to a million people. And they go back to America and proudly announce how, oh, how wonderful Nigeria is. They show pictures of crowds of people receiving Christ and the message they gave is that all is well in Nigeria. They never talk about what is happening in the North because their hosts never tell them about what is happening in the North. Now, this is highly unfortunate and this has actually been a problem to us. Can you imagine that an American pastor comes with his private jets to Nigeria, preaches for two days and is given a $1 million honorarium and he goes back to the US with it. 
other pastors will be rushing to go to Nigeria to preach and collect that kind of honorarium. And their concern is never about the plight of the persecuted because they're so well received, nobody tells them the reality of what is happening, the bloodshed that is occurring. So that has been a problem. And we need as the body of Christ to make sure that this is part of our engagement with our visitors who come, that they are fully aware that all is not well in Nigeria. Now, the third uh, level of engagement is with the US embassy. I will tell you, and this is very disturbing. This week, I had a meeting with uh, the US embassy in Abuja. And during the meeting, the, <laughs> the diplomat said three things that disturbed me. The first one is that he said that there's, no, there's really no big deal about religious problem in Nigeria, that there's just insecurity generally and it affects everyone. We're talking about 2021. We're talking about this week in Nigeria. This is what a US diplomat said. But the second thing that he said that really shocked me was, he now said that the Shiites in Nigeria are not proxies of Iran. That was when I had to interrupt him because I, I don't know if some of you recall, in 2020, over 22 containers of arms that were shipped by uh, Iran to Nigeria were seized in Lagos, in Tinkan Island. Now, what is shocking, many people don't know that he's, apart from Boko Haram and everyone else, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas are some of the terror groups that exist in Nigeria today. Their arms have been found in Nigeria. Their armories exist in Nigeria. But this diplomat was telling us to our faces this week that uh, Iran, that the Shiites in Nigeria are not proxies of Iran. This is totally false. Now, what is interesting is this morning when I woke up, I went into my archives and wrote and pulled out the article I wrote where I challenged the US uh, State Department for making a similar claim many years ago and showed them with facts and data. I emailed it to him to show him that he was wrong. I also emailed him data to show him that he was wrong about the uh, religious situation in Nigeria. So this is a battle that we have to engage in constantly. I wish I could say that this was a, a, you know, a momentary lapse by this uh, diplomat, but that is not true. This has been consistently what has been going on for the last 20 years that I have been engaged with the US foreign policy with regard to the persecution of Nigerians. The, uh, the, the, the US embassy, the UK embassy and the EU embassy are some of the worst uh, enemies of the truth of what is happening to Christians in Nigeria. Not only because they don't want to acknowledge it, but because sometimes they intentionally falsify information to their home governments to try and keep the truth out. And so what has happened is that we who are on this side have to challenge them with facts and figures to show that what they're saying is wrong. And the way we're able to go around the members, I mean, the diplomatic core in Nigeria is by reaching their members of Congress directly here and giving them facts and figures. And that is why we've been fortunate uh, that we've had one or two congressional delegations come out to Nigeria. And, uh, and as a result of that, they, they've been able to see uh, and find out for themselves on the first hand basis what is going on. So at this point, I want to encourage us that it is uh, important that we as uh, Christians join hands together uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, in Nigeria and in diaspora to engage with the international community. Um, as I prepare to wrap up, I want to quickly point out something. I am wearing a, a face mask with free layer. I wore it on the flight from Abuja to Lagos, from Lagos to Atlanta, Atlanta to DC. 
And I do that intentionally because it sparks a conversation. People will stop me and ask me. And people ask me in Nigeria, in Lagos, and in the US, who is Leah? And it gives me an opportunity to share her story. The point I'm trying to make is that we should be living epistles and advocates at all levels about what is happening in Nigeria. What is happening in Nigeria is truly, uh, as Prof just called it, he called it a pre-genocide. He called it, a, you, I, I don't know what he called it, but I call it a pre-genocide because it is truly that terrible. Just today, we got a report that the village of Lia in Adama State, that is her hometown where she's really from, was attacked. And over six Christians were killed and over 30 women were dislodged, were, were abducted. As I'm talking to you now, Leah's relatives in that village are in the bushes and we're trying to help them get out of there alive. This is happening right now. And what we're, we're doing is we're going to engage with the international community and let them know immediately. So we need to develop that kind of synergy where we can provide real-time intelligence uh, to key policymakers around uh, the globe. And so with those few comments, I would like to stop here and uh, open up for uh, time of questions and answers. Thank you. Marissa Ogebe, we are glad to have received your uh, sharing and the information that you provide, particularly the challenges that you are facing dealing with the diaspora, and dealing with the international community. So at this point, I'll be handing over again to my co-host to now handle the uh, question time. Uh, Sister Linda? Yes, yes, brother. We are brother, proceeding now to the issue of... Um, question and answer, or do you have a right of reply? I think there's a right of reply on the program. Otherwise, uh, we just move to question and answers. I think we need to take some, Some we still have time to take a, oh no. Okay. We do, we do. We, we have some time to take a few questions. I do not know, you can do it by the showing of your hand on the screen. If you're on the screen, if you're not on the screen, you might want to go to, um, um, press the link on your device that uh, is that is notably Matt raise hand, and if we if we see that, then we're coming, you know, to check on you for your for your question. So we can do it both sides. I, I see a few hands up already. Um, I'm going to ask us to start with um, Elder Yokunle Fagbemi. Are you there, sir? Thank you, you very you? much. Thank you, sir. I want to appreciate Prof for his presentation, which underscored the dynamics of embedded population and the networking of this embedded population into organized crime and criminality that has more to do with the complicity of state actors that are currently in security and law enforcement agencies. It is becoming clearer by the day that Christians will need to understand a lot more of the existing legal and policy frameworks so that when we are discussing a number of these issues, we call the crimes committed by the correct name and we will not jump into accepting the narratives that they are using to spin the matters of. A good example, there is nothing like communal clash. You always have issues of trespass and encroachment. And this encroachment goes with the dynamics of some other crimes like arson, murder, which are expected to be subjected to homicidal investigations, which they never do because they now call it with this glossy name of bandits and things like that. The second issue, which has to do with Prof's 
presentation and dovetails into Enos presentation, but is properly reinforced by Ima Ogebe's major challenge. And that is the inability for the Christian community to have alternate documentation materials that we can easily share and can be a reference material. For those of us who are research scholars that are privileged occasionally, when some materials are shared at the international level and they do get back to us to say, okay, kindly go through this document. When you are looking at what has been presented as a report by some of the Christian organizations, you cannot immediately use the standard of research or intellectualism to justify that which has been presented. A good example, you look at the report of Amnesty International, Transparency International, which are the status uh, locals, classicals that they would always want to make reference to. The way those reports are prepared, when you compare it with what we send out occasionally, there is a disconnect. And the other we agreed that we need to do more about documentation, the better for us. So part of what I will want to put on the table is how do we sponsor and support the publication of journals that will become internationally renowned that we are going to be using as part of the basis for the approaches. In terms of data gathering, which is what Eno was trying to make her, uh, 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 draw our attention onto, I plead with us that we must be very careful that when we are discussing as non-state actors and civil society stakeholders, we must never use the term intelligence. We are gathering data, and when you are gathering data, using cloud data sourcing and using geospatial technology that is available in public domain and at the commercial level, you may end up with the same kind of conclusive parameters that intelligence community security law enforcement will come to. But you would have used the correct phrase and you can get away with all you need to get away with. The problem that our brother, Obadiah Melafia, entered into was using that same word intelligence when he ought to have used data gathering. I want to thank you very much for a very good meeting. I thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It would appear as if uh, the issues you have raised is uh, very common to our three speakers. And so I'm going to call on uh, um, our, our brother, our very dear Prof, Professor Gideon. Are you still around, sir? Uh, I'm still around very much. Thank you, Ma. Okay, sir. My dear sister thank Linda, thank you, yeah. Uh, please, thank you so much. Uh, quickly, I'm actually not the professor, it's my wife. So many times oh. people call me professor. <laughs> not you, but everybody. Uh, well, I'm honestly first, I'm, I'm really impressed uh, by the quality of attendance and contribution in this presentation. Elder Fabemi is a dear brother and a friend. I'm so, so happy that um, he's part of this call and uh, I like his intervention. His, uh, his thoughts uh, are very, very uh, spot on. Uh, quickly, uh, let me just say that... Um, I, I think that the suggestion he made concerning using the right names is what I personally believe in. And, and to just say that um, it's an advice that I affirm and we need to because it helps us uh, in, in our advocacies, uh, advocacy that we do. Um, data gathering and being able to get some 
internationally recognized journals to help us publish them. I, I would put it back uh, in this way. Elder Fabemi, would you be willing to do something in this regard? <laughs> are, you, are you hearing me? Yes, sir. More, okay, than so, willing, sir. more than willing. Good. Okay. Okay. So just, just to let you know that we've been gathering some data. And we have significant data that we gathered last year. And we're continuing this year. And, um, and, and I, I will be very happy to share whatever data we have with AFD so that it can help us in our collective efforts. Um, I think I'll just leave it there so that others can come. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We we're very happy that uh, Elder Fagbemi is, is very cooperative and willing, sir. Thank you. And uh, we also would, uh, we would follow up with him so that we can, we can also properly coordinate with you. I think I'll be asking um, um, uh, Brother Umo, Enoch Umo, are you still there? Yes, I am here. Okay, would you like to respond to the question that uh, was raised, the issues raised by, by our elder Fagbemi? Uh, yes, can uh, possibly just could I just get a re a recap of the the question at hand? Okay, elder Fagbemi, are you still there, sir? What I presented was to acknowledge your good submissions and they want to plead with us that rather than use the phrase intelligence, we should always use data gathering and understand that crowd data sourcing and the use of geospatial technology is something that is available and when properly articulated, we can easily use it for our documentation and that a number of the high end that we are presenting are such that are supposed to be utilized by stakeholders who are interested in verifying and validating so that it is easier for us to separate the rudimentary from the high end. That was the essence of my submission, and that it is not going to be enough for us to gather this data without publishing it in a manner with which we can communicate with other stakeholders in terms of advocacy for proactive responses. And I just wanted you to uh, kindly bring that out as you are relating with us. I thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Omo, would that be okay with you? Is yes, that, yes. Okay. Certainly, certainly. Um, so, so yes. Thank you, thank you for the 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 um, the question and the uh, thoughts around that. So, yes, of course, data is is gold, um, as we say. Um, so, um, you know, specifically when you talk about drones and uh, the, the practical use and, and what we like to refer to as actionable data. So, um, you know, as, as the elder mentioned, not just data that, you know, you're going to look at on a chart or, or, or receive readings from, but how do we transform that data into, you know, actual change? Um, what is that data going to, to bring us? Um, so, you know, from an, an aerial uh, perspective, um, I've laid out, you know, some of the different applications uh, that we can uh, look at, but I, I would actually consider, um, you know, uh, being able to, to monitor, you know, areas of, of land. Um, mm -hmm. I know we've mentioned about, you know, how, uh, you know, different areas have been occupied by, uh, you know, certain people. 
um, this can all be tracked. You know, this can, can we can know exactly, um, you know, uh, if there's our new structures, you know, that are, are being built or even taken down or, you know, how, how much activity is, 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 is concentrated to a, a certain area. Um, so, you know, most likely this would be using uh, really, uh, as we call stealthy drones, you know, something that necessarily cannot be uh, detected um, and, and would be able to, you know, provide that data back to, you know, the, the command centers and the ones that need it. Now, this drone technology that, that we're referring to in data gathering is not new for uh, the government. Um, of course, you know, the U.S. Um, supplies a, a lot of military grade equipment and, and, and weapons and, and, and what have you um, through existing, um, you know, diplomatic uh, partnerships. Um, but that's only to a select few uh, group of, 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 eight, of individuals who are even trained um, to, to run it, you know, properly. So what we are talking about is, is more empowering um, really the average Nigerian you know, to be able to, to utilize uh, this technology, to take advantage of it and to um, use it for good. Um, you know, there, there are definitely ways that, but, you know, again, we have to, to sensitize the population. We have to, um, you know, uh, implement it in a way that it can be used. Um, and most importantly, um, doing it in an ethical way. Um, you know, there are plenty of examples and I'm, I'm sure you can think of plenty of examples of, of how drones um, can be used for, for bad, you know, purposes. It's really the reason why we haven't had a full regulatory structure role out here in Nigeria, because most of the agencies are so concerned about the bad uses of drones um, and the negative connotation when it comes to the whole spying and, and security. So we are in a way countering, you know, those thoughts um, and countering those ideas because we know that there's a lot more good uh, than, than bad, you know, can come uh, with, with this technology. So um, yes, hopefully that, that provides, um, you know, some insight on, on, the, on the data uh, piece. Um, but of course, you know, um, drone technology is only one piece of this big, you know, equation, this big problem. So, you know, we're not, we're not claiming that drones are going to, to, to be the end all be all. Um, we have to use it in conjunction with the other tools, the other uh, methods that we're using to, to help this, this issue. So hopefully um, that's provided some insight. I think you're on mute. Okay. Thank you so very much, Mr. Omo. I think we have a good understanding, um, but we would also want to hear from our brother, um, Emmanuel Ugebe. Uh, you, you would like to contribute to uh, what um, Elder Fagbemi has um, yes. put up us. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I really appreciate the point he has made. Um, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, I have over the years, you know, made the effort to document a lot of this uh, in the style, in a legal style. And we have made a lot of presentations to the U.S. government and to the U.S. Congress, which is now part of the historic record on the persecution of Christians. Let me say quickly here that in Nigeria right now, I spoke to the heads of two key denominations in Northern Nigeria, and they do not know how many members they've lost or how many churches they've lost. But the one church that has done the good job is the EYN church. They lost 10,000 members to the insurgency. That is the largest number of Christians killed anywhere in the world from one single church. And when President Osi, uh, Vice President Osimajo came here to America and was claiming that more Muslims were killed than Christians, I was able to stand up with confidence and tell him that I have this data. And I told him, I said, Your Excellency, if you don't have the data, I'll be happy to provide it to your office. And I subsequently emailed him the data. 
So the importance of data cannot be overemphasized. The, mm. the, the, the sad thing, though, is that the church, EYN, is an affiliate of an American denomination. And the American denomination here does not tell anyone that they lost 10,000 members in Nigeria. Mm. So that shows you the problem we have. If you have data and you don't use it, it is no use. Mm. And this is what all of us here should know the data and we should all say it. Okay. Thank you so much. We're grateful, Brother Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Wonderful, painstaking work you've been doing over the years. We're so appreciative. Uh, we have about three, a few more hands on, but I want to call on um, um, Mr. Alexandra Edu. Are you there, sir? Mm -hmm. Mr. Alexandra Edu. Mr. Alexandra Edun, can you unmute? Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're welcome. Can you yes, make your uh, as brief as possible? I will, I will. Thank uh, you. I want to appreciate our speakers, uh, most especially the brother from the US that is in Nigeria to establish uh, his company. Uh, you have become a prayer point for me and my small congregation that you will not be frustrated in Nigeria <laughs> they'll establish you. Uh, my question goes to our brother on the global uh, cancel US Nigeria. Uh, the leadership that compromised to join the government uh, over that group, uh, is the group no more functioning? What can we do to keep that group going on? And then number two, since you are based in the U.S., uh, I pray God raise people like you in the U.S. to sensitize the Christian Nigerian community in the U.S. to actually know what is going on in Nigeria, just as much as you know. So what can we do in that regard, sir? Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a, a very good question. Now, one of the saddest things about that mm -hmm. is that... Uh, the brother who was leading our Canaan here went back to Nigeria and began to issue statements denying that there was persecution in, in Nigeria. And when our brethren here, pastors, called him to, to call him to order, he told them that I was exaggerating the killings of Christians in Nigeria. That is how mm. sad it is uh, that you know some people allow uh, access to power to influence uh, th them over the truth. Uh, we will try to resuscitate the organization. But, uh, the way I see it, a lot of people were so disenchanted that uh, uh, it would take a lot of effort to rebuild that organization. But mm. we continue to engage with other uh, uh, Nigeria-based groups and Nigerian faith communities. Um, but I don't know how we'll be able to uh, restore Canaan to his lost glory. Hmm. Hmm. Thank hmm. you so very much, Brother Emmanuel. Uh, I think we'll try and take as much as small questions as we can, perhaps two or three, because we're getting close to our, our timing. Um, Mr. David Gwent. Yes, ma. I am here. Mr. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you like to? Yes, I, 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 I am happy to be part of this meeting today. In fact, uh, we, we just had a conference just uh, ending last weekend, and I was shocked to find out that, you know, sometimes our Christian brethren are more, are more sometimes they don't even tend to know actually what is happening. Mm. I, I am I am in Zaria now, currently. So it's like it's like okay, if it just happened, you just like react to it, and then it, it goes it goes off. And then we are not strategic. We are not even giving it time to be able to go back and begin to dig deeper and 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 find out what actually happened, what actually is behind the scene, and all those things like that. So my concern is that all this has been happening and is still happening. You know, Christian persecution is still there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot more than what the eyes can see. But 
how can we be able to get an average Christian to understand that this is the situation in Nigeria? How can we as a church, how can the church in Nigeria be able to, to, to go for that, to, to let the average Christian know that actually what he is seeing is beyond what the eyes can see? I don't know. Um, Dr. Gideon, sir, would you be would you be able to uh, respond to this, Brother Gideon? Is this yes, still yes, <laughs> yes, I'm still there. The I'm, I'm there. Yes, I, I was uh, listening to his question. I think again because of the time. I don't know when you plan to end so that we don't uh, prolong. Mm -hmm. But very clearly. My little experience, one, I think that the church is compromised on many fronts. Mm. So that is a huge challenge. Mm. Second, uh, some of those Christians who have had the privilege of serving in the government mm. are even doing more to deny that anything whatsoever is going on against Christians in this country, more than even those that I'll call faith of our neighbors. So that is a huge concern. Mm. Uh, if you understand the way government works, they would like to walk through those organs that they have set in set, set in, 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 in place. Mm -hmm. So they would like to hear from those they've appointed to work with them. And if those who are appointed to work with them deny the reality of what Christians are experiencing, mm -hmm. when you talk from outside, Gwen, nobody would listen to you. But it's not mm -hmm. just that nobody would listen to you, it's that they are not even going to allow you to come together to have a strategy. Now, whether we accept it or not, the truth is that there's a lot of divide and rule that's taking place within Christendom. Mm. Mm. So I think that it, it, is, it, is, it is more of modest efforts such as this mm -hmm. that will help us. Mm. Again, I'm only trying to be brief because I don't want to stretch and stretch and just keep talking. So, yeah, there are pockets. I also won't say that there's clearly no strategy whatsoever. No, there are pockets of efforts. It's how we can also unify those pockets of efforts so that we work together rather than tearing one another as, mm. uh, as, uh, apart. Mm. Now, let me just give you this small testimony. Please, uh, again, I'm, I'm careful because of time. I mentioned that we've been doing research and believe me, we're gathering data. I mean, I know the data we gathered last year, so I know exactly from what we have, uh, the number of Muslims that are killed and the number of Christians that are killed. Now, of course, when you bring in bandits, it's a different equation altogether, but we try to document. Now, I'm more careful when I talk in Christian meetings because sometimes I do get calls uh, from uh, from, from our neighbor's faith. And they quite frankly do share data when their people get killed. So I do have that. And I, and I tend to want to respect that. But when I put it in to all the, what that I got together, significantly more Christians were killed last year than Muslims. The government does their talk. Okay, we provide what we have. So the group we're working with to get that data, they provided that data to Open Doors UK. And I happened to be in UK at the time, so they brought together a team of people to present aspects of that report. And over a hundred members of parliament were on that call. And from around the world, over 2,000. That report was presented. So they talked about what was happening around the world, but the highest light was on Nigeria. Now, our brother, uh, uh, Barrister Gibe, talked about internal advocacy. Now, when you're also dealing with diplomatic circles, you've got to know what you have to say outside and what you just deal with them inside. But I can tell you this, as a result of that presentation of the report, 
those parliamentary guys, a hundred of them, including a cabinet minister level who was there, they reached out to the British High Commission in Nigeria. And from the little I know, there's going to be a small conference on Nigeria and they're going to be dealing at some of these issues. Mm. Now, like our brother Elder Fabimi said, when they keep using farmer headers, clash, din, things, 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 and things. Sorry, sorry that I'm using Nigerian lingo. I don't plan to do that. But you need to know what's happening. Mm. You need to make a separation between when defenseless communities are attacked by people in large numbers. Some of these people, they are trained. Yeah. Would you call that a clash? Between who? Defenseless farmers? So those are some of those facts. The embassies go with that language, but you've got to use the facts on the ground to prove them otherwise. Mm. So we will need, I, I would say that there are still modest efforts. And even some of the efforts that AFD is putting together you, just, you, you can't dismiss that because that's also part of a strategy to take us somewhere. So I agree that we're compromised. I agree that some of those Christians who are in government are even mm. undermining the church, but mm. there are still, they still hope that there are voices who are doing the best they can to ensure that the truth of what is happening in Nigeria is accepted and respected. Now, it's going to be tough, but let's keep going. Mm. I, I leave it there, my dear sister Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so very much. Um, I think we can manage two more questions um, um, if you make it very brief, but it's been so rich. We're so thankful. Uh, I, I'm going to have to take two more. Uh, Brother Rotemi, Uh, Brother Rotimi, sir. I am here, ma'am. Yes, I see that your hands are, your hands are up, sir. That is true. Okay. Um, I want to thank the speakers who have uh, spoken uh, at this forum, and it's been rich and very informative. Um, there's a question, or rather a comment or a question I wanted to make. Um, while I thank uh, Brother uh, Mr. Umo for his presentation and all that, um, I actually was also looking forward to how um, drone technology, either by communities or nationalities within Nigeria, how they can find it useful and effective in terms of uh, checkmating insecurity, particularly in the area of data gathering. Uh, while he's thinking on that, there's a comment I'd like to make, please. Uh, and it is that, you know, I think we have to redefine the approach of the church to what is happening in Nigeria. You know, when the, when the attacks began, it started with Boko Haram destroying churches. And so the definition mm -hmm. of what was happening was classified as persecution. But today, I think the facts point to something else. I think the facts indicate that there is ethnic cleansing. And I think um, the indigenous nationalities put it succinctly um, when they were doing their first major and all of that. And they described this as um, um, some people have called it genocide, uh, but other people have, the, uh, you know, the nationalities have called it extermination or extinction. You know, it's a plan of extinction, is a plan of extermination. The reason I'm making this point is that unless we reclassify what is happening in Nigeria and call it by its proper name, any Christian will still continue to think that what we have is persecution. The attitude of a Christian to persecution, you know, will be to react the way that Christ will have us react to persecution. But when we classify it the way it ought to be, I think that what will happen is that our reaction to what is happening is likely to be different. That's just my comment on, um, on that. I don't know whether um, Mr. Omo can take about two minutes to just talk about how drone technology can be useful for data gathering 
uh, because it talks so much about the, uh, you know, uh, so much of the aspects of drone technology, but, you know, the essence of uh, using it for security, if you could just enlighten us a bit, I think it would be appreciated. Thank you. Mm. Yes, yes, thank you so much, sir, for, for the question. Um, so yes, um, there is a, a huge opportunity when it comes to um, the applications and especially on the community level. Um, I would say one of the biggest factors um, uh, to, to enable you know, more widespread use, of course, you know, lie with the regulations. Um, right now, the, the NCAA um, are still in the process of developing. That's what, what, that's what you have to think of. What's wrong with you? Who's this now? Okay, so uh, the NCAA. Uh, if I can just interrupt you, Mr. Mo, for a while, please. I want to ask each and every one of us to please mute our mics. If you are not called upon to speak, be kind enough to mute your mic so that your background um, um, discussions do not filtrate into the course of what of what we're trying to articulate here. Thank you so very much. Sorry, Mr. Omo, can you continue? No problem, no problem. So um, the, the regulatory structure is very, very important. So um, one of the things that we're doing is, is working hand in hand uh, with the NCAA uh, to make sure that they are able to roll out, um, you know, sensible uh, and seamless uh, regulations. Right now, the issue is it's so, hard to, to get a, a, a drone license that you have thousands, tens of thousands, excuse me, of unlicensed, unregistered drone pilots who are, you know, flying around um, and, and not in the system. Um, and that's because, um, you know, currently the, the process is, is, is too difficult. So in that sense, once that problem is, is solved, um, then the, the use will be more widespread and you know we can develop uh, community-led efforts um, that use drones to uh, secure you know different premises. Um, you know I mentioned the uh, drone that comes with a thermal camera already installed in it, the DJI uh, Mavic Enterprise Dual. Um, a, a, a drone of that capability is going to price anywhere from 1.1 to 1.3. Um, you know, a million naira, which may not be, you know, readily available. Um, so in that case, you would use a, um, a, a more, you know, economically, you know, friendly drone, uh, something that we call, uh, let me just show you, something like a, a DJI Mavic Mini 2, uh, which has the same capabilities to fly. Um, I, I believe this goes up to four to five kilometers um, in one flight. So you can actually do just visual checks um, to see you know, what's going on. But if you want to do any surveys at night, of course, you would need another sensor as in a thermal or a night vision uh, camera. So um, I very much believe that you know, if, if criminals know that there are you know, uh, a drone in the area or knows that the, the authorities are equipped with a drone that can um, track and, and um, really see, uh, even if it's just the color of a, of a person's shirt. I mean, there, there's actually a viral video that came out just a few weeks ago of a gentleman who actually used his drone, this same exact drone here, to track down someone who stole his uh, laptop. Um, so, you know, he was able to find it. I wish I had the link here. If anyone has seen that video, please uh, go ahead and post the link here. But it's, it's something that's been blowing up. I have at least 15 people, you know, send me that video. But it's a pure example of, you know, practical situations, practical scenarios where uh, the drones can be used for that aerial, you know, surveillance. So not only is it a deterrent, um, but you can actually, you know, capture images and video of whatever um, that you are that you're trying to see. Um, the local um, police agencies um, should be, you know, utilizing this, um, but then also on a community level as well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's good, especially when you have large, um, you know, uh, plots, you know, of land, uh, large uh, estates, you know, uh, we're also approaching actual security agencies 
uh, who are the ones that guard these estates. So now we can train the security officers who already are patrolling that state, um, the estate, but now they can do it with a drone. So those are some of the, the different applications. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. We'll take just one question more, and that will be from Mr. Inka Quadri. Um, are you there, sir? Is there Mr. Inka Quadri around? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, my question is just a sort of amplification of uh, most of the last comments on the on this platform. And like others, I want to commend the effort behind this meeting and also those who came to especially deliver their presentations to us. But my own concern simply is that it seems a lot of our brethren do not appreciate that what is going on in Nigeria today is nothing but supremacy war of conquest and colonization. Of course, this is not declared by any means, but we, sh we should know, I mean, those who know, know that there is an agenda of about less than 5% of us who are bent on subjugating the rest of us. And it's a global agenda, but it seems as if we do not appreciate the enormity of this problem. And from the little work we have done, we know, a lot of us know that if the Christian community alone in Nigeria come together, they can deal with this issue fully and finally within a set time. But unfortunately, the Christian community in this country is so fragmented, like, like I've been said before, on this mm -hmm. program. We are so dis disconnected. We are so, everybody's doing their own thing in their own little corners, uh, irrespective of what, whatever other people are doing. Uh, whereas it is commonplace for us to say, oh, let everybody be doing their own thing. Eventually, everything will work out. But incidentally, it doesn't work out like that because we end up spending, I mean, dissipating energies and resources in a way that do not give us the maximum results. So for some of us, I think seriously that the challenge that we face is not as much as the challenge of communication that has been mentioned, the challenge of uh, other kinds of engagement, but the challenge of coordination. And until we are able to coordinate ourselves as major and critical stakeholders in this Nigeria project, we will continue to be at the receiving end of all of this evil. I mean, this bare-faced barbarity and brutality. So what is left for us to do, particularly the leaders of the Christian faith? Of course, some people have somehow insinuated that this may not necessarily be a persecution or religious confrontation, because like some people said, some Christians, some Muslims are equally also killed. I mean, if you look at what is happening in, in, in the Northwest, where bandits so-called, uh, they are invading, so, I mean, communities, killing people. They don't ask who you are before they kill. So the truth of the matter today, as we all, as we all know, is that there is a sinister war that is already declared on Nigeria. And there is no time for us to be genuflecting and gesticulating. We need to come together. The Nigerian Christian community needs to come together very urgently. And for me, that is the challenge I'm going to leave all of us here with. If there is anything we need to do, we need to begin the immediate coordination. We now have the resources, we have the capacities. Listen, I know that the Christian community in Nigeria can deal with this issue. I mean, like Brother Gibe is doing in America. I know what he's doing there. We are close. Like uh, uh, Reverend Paramalam has given us a lot of uh, insight about all of these things. And our other brother that came with the drone technology and all of that. The truth of the matter is that all of these efforts, if they are not integrated, we may not achieve the results we are, we are achieving. And I know that deep down the heart of each and of, every one of us here, we want a solution. So mm -hmm. I am pleading as a round up, round up that look, in the name of God and Jesus Christ that we all look up to, let us find a way. I think that may be or should be the primary responsibility of this platform of bringing Christian, the Christian community in Nigeria together for an integrated solution. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir. I think we're going to have to 
uh, do a double fast one. And if we just can call on uh, Mr. Ken. Okay, Chuku, are you there, sir? If you can just give us your question. In a few seconds, it will help us because we have run out of time. Mr. Ken, okay, Chuku, are you there, sir? Mr. Ken, okay, Chuku. All right, okay. I think he is not immediately around. I want to hand over, Brother Richard, can I hand over to you for the closing? Uh, summary and closing. Okay, Ma. We, we are grateful to God for the privilege to serve the Christian community. AFD, first and foremost, is a Christian community. Uh, but at the same time, we are also looking at a national problem and providing solutions to it. We do not pretend uh, to be who we are not. But at the same time, our objectives are quite patriotic and not narrow. Uh, we want to thank, uh, well, he says he's not a professor, so we, we are back to Reverend uh, Gideon Paramalam uh, for the presentation he gave us. Uh, it was quite under short notice, and uh, we thank God for his courage to still come on and uh, not only make the presentation, but two questions. So we will be relating with you, sir, if you are still with us on those seven points uh, for peace and security, um, we would hope you'll be, make, you'll be able to make the material available to us. Uh, beloved brother, Eno Mo, I want to thank you greatly for making our time to be with us on this program. Uh, you should, or you would want to know that the technology that you have will be on high demand in Nigeria, and um, you would be needing to maybe adapt the benefits of this uh, technology to the very, very urgent and pressing needs in the community where we have. I also saw that uh, video clip of a man who was able to use drone technology to uh, retrieve his stolen laptop. I also saw it was very wonderful. So please, sir, um, thank God you have an office on BI now. Uh, the communities in Nigeria desperately need uh, the drone technology, particularly for ethical work. I want to thank our barista, Ima Ogebe. Um, he's a very versatile lawyer on the issues that we have put before him. He has a lot of data uh, on this thing. And there was a time some of us were even putting together some data also on all the massacres and things that were going on. Uh, where we realized that Nigerians generally don't gather. Uh, they just hear about this and they just move on when it is possible for us to put them together. So we want to thank you uh, profoundly for making our time to come. We know how tight it was for you. And we continue to pray that God will grant you success as you carry the advocacy beyond our shores. Uh, it may interest some of us to know that uh, Barista Ogebe is not only doing it outside, he many times flies into Nigeria to do a lot of work uh, before going out again. So we really want, we appreciate you. Thank you for coming. I uh, want to thank everybody that has made it a day, uh, our elder Fagbemi especially, uh, for your contribution. And uh, you are a friend of the house. We are trusting that God will continue to make you available for us. So with this, I thank everybody for coming. Um, my co-host, Sister Linda, is there anything I'm overlooking? Is there any matter I've left out? As yes. 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 I think we need uh, to thank Mr. Kedafor as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Permit, so, permit me, one, one of those in the diaspora para is uh, my sister Titi from Manchester. I noticed she is here. Okay. That's but but family. also to say that I've already that's the chairman of my group link. where I belong. Oh, that's okay. good. I've already posted the link with the seven points uh, already on the on the group chat. Okay. All right. We're so we're so grateful, sir. Um, and we want to thank everyone that has, you know, uh, invested time 
and, and, and rest to come together to encourage us, uh, put our heads together concerning the issues that is facing us on the ground here in Nigeria. We are appreciative of all your contributions and we look forward to coming together again very soon. Thank you so very much. We'll take our closing prayer and then, and then we'll say bye-bye to each and every one of us. Brother Rotimi, is Brother Basu in the house, still in the house, sir? So our brother Basu still in the house? Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. We're about closing, so I would like you to give us your closing remark and, and prayers. Okay. Thank you, Thank sir. you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking all the guest speakers. Uh, Reverend Paramalam, thank you very much, sir, for coming. Brother Umo, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And of course, our brother Emmanuel Ogebe, thank you very much for the work you are doing. Thank you for your consistency. God bless you and God continue to strengthen you. We also want to thank the organizers, starting from our brother Ajiko, Sister Linda, Brother Richard, and then in the background, very quietly, not talking, Sister Ibilola and uh, Reverend Henry and all the other brethren in AFD who put all of this together. As we round up and we go from this program this evening, I will want to remind us of what Brother Yinka Kodri said. I think he kind of summarized everything we have been discussing here today. We are more than able to put an end to what is going on. The Christian community, we are more than able. We have the capacity spiritually, physically, intellectually, financially. Our problem is that inability to unite and focus as one. That is our main problem. And I've looked at this again and again, and I've come to one conclusion. We have leadership crisis. There is no central rallying point. Leadership. I pray in our various capacities, we will pay attention to this and let us try as much as possible. How do we build leadership? That is what we lack. And that is what the other side has. They have leadership and their leadership is in control. May God help us, but let us not doubt it. We shall overcome in the mighty name of Jesus. Once again, thank you everybody. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for tonight program for this evening program. Thank you for the grace. Thank you, Almighty God, for helping us thus far. As we round up, Father Lord, help us to implement all the key points that we have been able to gather at this meeting. Help us, Almighty God, to put our house in order so that division will not destroy us. Help us, Heavenly Father, that by your grace, we shall overcome. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. So much. Thank you so much once again to all our friends and our brethren. We pray that the Lord continues to sustain our faith. Um, until the next time we see, we're so grateful to each and everyone once again. Please remain blessed and continue to pray and let us do all the needful. And the Lord will continue with us in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.
Good night, Good everyone. Night. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. 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 Mm. bye. All the way from Canada. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Is that Banga good to see you around? <laughs> That's Thank you so much. Well done, brother Richard. Uh, Thank you. Thank God bless you. you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, you can you. God bless you for coming. We miss you. We don't hear so much of you on the FD again, but we miss you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. You're there for us. <laughs> we are all together, sir. We will win this battle. Man. God bless you, sir. Thank, Thank you very you. much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, everybody. <laughs> Anita, God bless you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Linda. Sister Linda and Barista Kelani, wonderful jobs, wonderful Thank jobs. You, Anita. God bless Thank you. you. Ma, 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 Thank ma. you for the me. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We Thank bless you. the Lord. We bless the Lord. Sister uh, Billy, thank you so much. God bless you, woman of God. God oh, bless you. Woman. So nice. Oh, so nice, man. I know you were praying in the background. <laughs> yeah, we are yeah. glad to have you here. Yes. Amen. Thank you. So, Sister Bella, please uh, make sure you are always with us. So we won't want to miss you again. <laughs> yes, by God's grace, I'm getting yeah. better. Yes, Thank God. Thank God. Well done, man. Yes, well done, man. God bless you, man. Bless you. Bless you, man. Thank sister, you, Doctor. Nice to have you here, <laughs> Professor Joe. God bless you, sir. Brother Mayowa, thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> Uh, this is from Pretoria. You know, yeah. you are so, so oh, busy. you are in South Africa. I'm in Pretoria. I'm in Pretoria. Yeah, Love God bless. God bless you. Good to have you around. Yeah. I miss you. I miss you. Yeah. Well done. Oh, Brother Tay. Thank you. Brother Tay. Yes, ma. Hello. I'm going to do hello. <laughs> From Pretoria. Oh, okay, I'll tell you what's here. Thank God. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Brother yeah. Abila. Brother Abila, good to see you. Nadu, hello. Yes. <laughs> thank, well thank you so much. We thank God. We uh, thank God. So much of us going off. We need to Not greet you. Yes. Eshe Popo. Thank God for you, sir. Uh, Professor Day. Your Brother Day was in the background, you know, listening and praying. Listening and praying. I think I'm a praying machine. <laughs> <Thank God. laughs> Learning to <laughs> ah, learning. Yeah. I see that be the case. So Thank you, <laughs> brother. Should I go, Joe? Yes, I shall. <laughs> Lord bless you, sir. Thank you, man. Lord yeah. bless you. Uh, you are busy, in the body. bro. Richard, you thank me? you. I mean, I was looking at your something here. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Good night, everyone. You. I'm checking out now. Night. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. God bless Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Bye. Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye.
Brother Richard, thank you. And you know, Brother Ruth, me is up. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>